Hello, friends of the internet. I am thrilled to be here today with Mara Temkovich, director of Under the Gray Sky, which is set to have its world premiere at Tribeca 2024 this Friday, June 7th, at the Village East Angelica at 9 p.m., followed by a second screening on Monday, June 10th at 6 p.m. at the AMC on 19th Street, and a final screening on Saturday, June 15th at 11.15 a.m., again, at the Village East Angelica. Brief synopsis of the film, it's your debut feature and depicts the crackdown of a demonstration of a protest of the 2020 Belarusian election when the main character of the film, who's a anti-regime journalist, Lena, is arrested for live streaming the event and kind of gives a look at what political rep repression looked like in, in, in the modern day. So I know that was a long intro, Mara, but thank you for joining me today. How are you? Oh, thank you for having me. I'm very glad to be here with you. So I guess first things first, how do you relate to this project? Was this a personal experience or something else? Well, before I got to film, I used to be a journalist. I'm Belarusian, but I live in Poland. I used to be a journalist and I used to work on the same TV station my main character does and the inspiration for the main character did. Uh, so in a way, it's a personal story, it's a personal connection. Uh, well, my husband is also the editor. He's also a part of the film. So he was the one organizing uh, the live transmissions uh, during the protest uh, uh, in Belarus in 2020 for the independent TV station here uh, broadcasting from Poland. Besides my personal experience and personal connection, what happened in Belarus in 2020 could not leave anyone indifferent, you know. Yeah, for sure. And that kind of answers my questions about what aspects of your life kind of bleed into this. How did you try to incorporate that in this and try to represent those that story as um, close to real life as possible? Well, the main choice was not to try and stage uh, the protest as a part of our fictional shooting. So mm -hmm. I made the decision to use the real shooting, the real material that the, the two, two journalists shot during this uh, peaceful crackdown. So uh, this material is actually documentary material. Uh, I decided to do that uh, because I feel that what we had happening in the real life was so powerful that no um, stage in it in the fictional story would come in even close. And that worked very nicely with the general idea of the way how I'd like to incorporate you know, elements of real life into a fictional story, which is also created to portray the real life, although, you know, there are some fictionalized elements in the story of the characters, obviously, but basically the film tells us the story of a certain reality that exists. So this documentary parts will work well, in my opinion. Yeah, and that actually naturally brings me to my next question. Can you talk about the decision to approach the film in a narrative rather than a documentary style? Well, I think that, first of all, I don't do documentary fiction films. It, it is what I do, although I came to the fiction films from journalism and the documentaries might seem like a natural, you know, bridge. But I do fiction films. I have bigger control and yeah, bigger power over the narrative, I think. It's a very different approach work-wise. How do you create a documentary story and how do you create a fiction story? But, well, I also think that in my film... The politics of it is not the most important part of the film. Sure. First of all, it's a human story. It's a story of those two characters who are going through a very real thing happening to people. It's connected to politics. It's very placed in a certain place, in a certain historical moment. But I wanted to dig deeper into the choices they make as human beings. So it's not a reportage about politics in more than Belarus. It's, it's not that. And that is not something that would interest me. What I was trying to portray and trying to understand is how a person can survive in this reality, which is dissolutioning around them and what kind of choices we have to face. And I think that this 
part of the story it's universal and those kind of choices can be made by people everywhere in a different situations which apply not only to the current groups. so having in mind this aspect of the human choices of these particular characters of what love is at the end and how do you accept the choices of a loved one and what would you sacrifice to maintain this that is uh, the core of the story yeah uh, i want to jump in on that journalism part um because I didn't actually know you were a journalist before this. So can you talk about how your journalism career defined this as your first debut feature? Well, my dream was, as I live in Poland, and I was educated in film in Poland as well, my dream was to make a Belarusian story my debut, and I actually had something else in mind. But then the protest happened. Is that what's on the board over there? No, this one is the one that is actually made. I called it my wall of tears. I spent so many hours putting and switching and finding some combination that might work that I got it as a gift from my production and I can't bring myself to take it out and to put new film here. Yeah. yeah. So it was not a choice like I will make the feature debut about a journalist because I used to be one. It was not such a straightforward way. But I think that, well, my background helped me to understand the character I create a little bit better, maybe, and also sure. to relate to the choices I had to make at some point and also, you know, to find, to understand this desire to bring the story out there and to, to, to get this truth out there and, yeah, make of understanding. But it, it's not a film about the journalist because I used to be one. It's just, I care about the real stories and the stories that are, you know, very connected to the social issues that might be connected to my journalistic background. And that's why I pick those kind of stories, which are extremely realistic, very very close to life and always focus on some important issue that is moving and somehow resonating with me. Yeah. And then this next question actually comes from my grandma because she volunteered in Belarus. She wanted to know that, or rather, she noticed from her friend's photos that live in Belarus that Minx, how do you pronounce that? Minx. Minx is looking very modern and she wanted to know how the economy is doing and how people are and if people are able to find work and stay in country? Well, I have to tell you that the last time I've been to Belarus was in January 2022. Uh, Before my feature debut, I've done a short film which focused on the story of the journalists in the apartment broadcasting from the protest. So the full feature is sort of building on that. And because of that film getting public, I can't go to Belarus anymore without risking being arrested myself. So it's very hard uh, for me to say from some sort of personal experience how life is now. I think it changed a lot since 2020 when maybe this impression would be accurate in 2019 when the economy was not so bad. You know, there was some space for some freedoms. Of course, Lukashenko was always a dictator, but it varied how hard the dictatorship is. Are we in a, in a soft era or are we in a hardcore era? Well, now it's very, very difficult. And in my feeling, you know, in, in my understanding from, from outside. And it changed a lot after Russia started the full scale invasion of Ukraine using Belarusian territory and involving Belarus in this conflict. So I think Belarus is going backwards in this sense. Well, thank you for indulging my grandma. I'm sure even, yeah, I'm sure she'll enjoy even, you know, that little snippet of it. I think. One last, I guess, mega question is what I like to call this. What do you hope, I guess, what do you hope audiences take away from watching this at Tribeca? And how does it feel to be in Tribeca? I haven't asked that yet, but yeah, this is your debut feature. So, Oh, I'm thrilled. I'm worried. I'm scared. (laughs) I'm excited. I feel so many things at once that I can't begin uh, describing it. Uh, It's my first time in New York as well. It's my first time at Tribeca Festival, not just with my film, but in general. So I'm very, very, you know, excited about premiering such a huge event. And it's it's a huge honor. It was my dream festival to have the world premiere there. So in that sense, it's a dream come true. 
what would I like the audience to take from the film in a weird way for me when I answer myself of what the film is about? Well, it's about hope, even though it might not seem that way right after you watch it. I think that what I'd like the audience to take from that film is that we as people have this little thing inside us that makes us resist that makes us resist oppression and that makes us resist injustice, even in situations that seems unwinnable. And maybe this is part which is fighting for because it makes us human. Yeah, and I think that's a great answer. But, okay. Mara, I want to thank you so much for uh, taking your time out of your afternoon to talk with me and share your time and insights with me. Um, for for those listening, watching, you can catch Under the Gray Sky at Tribeca 2024 at the Village East Angelica this Friday, June 7th at 9 p.m. at AMC 19th Street on Monday, June 10th at 6 p.m. and the Village East Angelica again on Saturday, June 15th at 11.15 a.m. Uh, I'll have a review up on June 7th along with, I'm sure, a plethora of coverage and reviews and all the things you expect from Tribeca 2024 uh, throughout the month of June. Um, I'll have links to buy tickets in the description uh, of everywhere I post this. Um, But again, thank you, Mara, for your time. Uh, Thank you so much. And I also will be there for the screening of of the 7th and for the screening of the 10th. So if you guys watching and listening have any questions after the film, I'll be there to answer those. See you in Tribeca. Yeah, see you in Tribeca.